Good morning again. <laughs> sure. And that is Genesis 17. Uh, God, again, we just ask that you would help us to hear your word and to wait for your vision and your promise to come to pass, um, but also to be busy about practically serving you as you do the work. So thank you, God. Do the work in your word, we pray, in us. In Jesus' name, amen. So Genesis 17, um, I have a long title, and that's Abram fell on his face and God talked with him. But if you want to make it a short title, it's just God talked with him. God talked with him. Have you ever had a humbling experience? I would think so. I mean, all of us <laughs> probably admit at least once that we've had a humbling experience, a loss. Uh, you, thought, you thought you were getting an A on that test and you get it back. I don't know if I've ever had a problem with <laughs> <laughs> um, but maybe it was a failure or maybe you've been blessed by someone someone you, it just gives you some, something or says something about you maybe it's at work or so, to a friend or you hear about it and just blesses you because you know you feel like a failure and how often in my life do I sometimes feel as a failure as a dad and my daughter will, Mia will come to me and say dad you're the best dad in the whole world I'll go, thank you, sweetheart. <laughs> you know, and it really makes me feel better even when I know, right? Oh, it's just like this. <laughs> so get out of here, get out of there. <laughs> but Ash and I sometimes get a kick out of watching fail videos online <laughs> because sometimes it's just so funny. Fail, it, there's this whole thing where it's just fail videos. People riding a dirt bike and falling off or doing something silly. And most of the time it's someone being foolish, thinking they can get away and do something silly. And, you know, a lot of times they're, they've been drinking or, you know, they're out doing their thing on the quad on a frozen lake. And, well, it wasn't as frozen as they thought it was. <laughs> or, or that hill was steeper than they thought it might be. Or, you know, they tried to do a trick to show off on their motorcycle. And, well, <laughs> they fell off while trying to show off. But I'm glad that we did not have as many video cameras around when I was a kid as they do now. Um, my life, and I think a lot of our lives, were not lived out fully on social media. I'm thankful for it. There are a few videos that are good out there, but thankfully they aren't VHS, so it'll take you some effort to <laughs> even play them back. <laughs> but when it comes to reading the Bible, and I think this has been part of our study in Genesis, is how do we see and perceive the people and the stories in it? You know, our study, God and Man in Genesis, I think we've really hopefully seen a different side of both God and man so far uh, through our study. Not a, a new side, but a side perhaps that we've missed before. Hopefully we've seen some reality of these people and also how real God is to them despite the reality of their failures. A lot of times, you know, especially when you don't know the Lord and you think of the Bible, you think everyone's perfect in the Bible, everyone did everything right, you grow up and, you know, you hear all the stories of Moses and Abraham and all these guys who, you know, Joseph was pretty good, so he's not the best example to use because Joseph got everything pretty much right. But a lot of the guys in the Bible did it. And the stories we had in Sunday school, we kind of skipped over the hard parts because some of those things are a little hard for kids to hear. And I think sometimes that carries over into our adult understanding. And we, we don't, we separate ourselves from the, the reality and put ourselves in a fiction that God only works with perfect people or God only calls perfect people or that there's no way that God could use me like he could Abraham or David because I'm not like them. And, and that's not the truth. That's a fiction. The truth is that we're exactly the same as they are. They're exactly the same as we are. We haven't changed. Humanity is the same. And I think that ties into why people say the Bible's outdated because they don't realize that it's not. That it talks about real situations and real people. But more than that, through those real situations and real people, real God can be seen. And the fact that we can have a real relationship with the living God we seen like we saw with Hagar, she said, uh, I see the living God who sees me. You know, that even in the midst of that situation where her so-called believing masters throw her under the bus, she becomes to know the living God. And I think sometimes we put too much emphasis on ourselves and our ability in order for others to see God when it's really God's going to be seen by who he wants to be seen by. Um, and it, we have a responsibility to it to be a good picture of it, but it, the, he's... He's not going to let anyone slip through his fingers. You know, because being a Christian is not about being perfect. Despite what you may have heard, what you may have been taught, what you may even believe, 
It's not about being perfect, but it is about being holy. There's a difference between being perf perfect and holy. The enemy thinks he's perfect, but he's about as far from holy as you can be. Holy means to be separate, to be separated, uh, to be set apart. And if we're truly believers, we realize we're not perfect, and that allows us to be set apart. Because if we think we're perfect, we're missing the point of holiness. And that means set apart to God and washed by God and, and something that only God can do. We cannot make ourselves holy. We can separate ourselves and be religious and go be a monk up on the mountaintop and be separate. But as you'll read through different monks and the problems that they had, and man, I thought I was getting away from my sin, but now I'm in this room and it's still here, that the separation did not make them holy. But the being holy will make us separate. And that's because God is the one who does the perfecting work. You and I cannot make ourselves perfect. We can try and do our hair better in the morning, take two showers, get better deodorant, brush your teeth once a month, and <laughs> maybe get closer to perfection. Maybe you'll spend all your money. All these people are spending thousands and thousands of dollars to look like a Barbie doll or a Ken doll. But they'll never be perfect. So those dolls are little things of plastic. They're not alive. But James 1.4 says, But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. James, the half-brother of Jesus, says, Patience has its perfect work. Our work is to wait for God to work. You know, we talk about, oh, I need to be more patient. You know, as if, being patient in itself is the, is the good quality. Yes, it's good to be patient, but just being patient isn't the, the perfection. Being patient is waiting for the perfection of God to come. You know, we're waiting to hear back about some things in life, and, well, my boss decided to go have, an, have a baby. Thanks a lot, Trey. <laughs> now, if you'd ever listen to this, I think you'd find that funny. But you just have to wait. Okay, I know God's in control. God's got things he's taken care of so I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing Ephesians 2 8 through 10 says for by grace you have been saved through faith and that not of yourselves it is the gift of God not of works lest anyone should boast for we are his workmanship creating Christ Jesus for good works which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them uh, we even saved by grace not by works to walk in the works God has prepared beforehand that God prepared the work for us to do beforehand God prepared it so it's almost as if my wife went home as she always does wonderfully and prepares all the dinner ingredients or prepares a cake and all the ingredients and has the kids hop up on the counter and help her mix it after she's already mixed it after she's already broken the eggs and she's already preheated the oven and she helps them put it in the oven and they comes out like oh we made a cake they didn't really make a cake my wife made the cake. She prepared it beforehand, but they got to enjoy it. They got to be a part of it and feel like they had something to do in it. And I think that that would be a desire of my wife, too, to have a relationship with them like that. They, they do that stuff all the time. They made muffins like that recently. And the same thing with me. If I'm out mowing the lawn, they can sit on the tractor with me. And they didn't really do the work, but they got to be out there with me. And that was more important to me. And that's the same with God, that God prepared the work for you and I, not only to be perfected, but to do the work of the ministry beforehand. Beforehand. So that takes a lot of the, the pressure off, doesn't it, guys? If God's already done it, what does it say? We get to walk in it. We just get to walk in it. It's already done. It's already been paved. We don't have to get the hot tar and make the road. We just get to walk on it with our feet shod in the boots of the preparation of the gospel of peace. But legalism gets in the way of that. Legalism says that you have to do the work to make yourself perfect. And if you don't match up to this law of perfection, well, you're not perfect. Well, no kidding, we're not perfect. That, the law was a schoolmaster to bring us to a savior, right? But legalism, a lot of times, has this trying to fit into someone else's mold or even a mold of our own making. We come into a church or Christianity with an idea, perhaps, of what it is, what it's about. Maybe we've grown up around it, at least in Western culture. And we think we need to fit in this way, wear this kind of suit, dress this way, act this way. And maybe some of it's right, because obviously, 
you know, if we're saved, we're saved from something. So obviously some things are going to go by the wayside. We're not going to do everything we used to have to, we used to do. But that doesn't mean that you're going to trade in your flannel for, for uh, hound's tooth. You know, you're going to trade in your shorts for slacks. Maybe you need to, maybe those shorts are a little ratty, you need to go to Kohl's and get 20% off. But sincerely, there's no legalism in that. We've seen a lot of that uh, in the church in the, in the last half century was, we need to start accepting people for who they are and let them come in and realize that God doesn't care if you have a suit or not. Yeah, now if you want to wear a suit and you find that as a way to glorify God and that's just how he made you, you like wearing suits and you have a bunch, fine, go for it. But maybe you have a bunch of suits and God's saying, I never wanted you to wear a suit. I want you to get rid of those suits. Give them to the food bank on Saturday. I want you to be someone else. Because legalism, it's hard. It hurts. In the end, it never works out. There's always a failure. We're left broken, ashamed, and alone. Because if, we're, if we don't match up to the legal standards, we're kicked out. Like an Olympic athlete... They're all facing some sort of legal standard to match up, and when they fail, well, you took drugs. You can't, you can't compete anymore. A lot of times we take that to be Christianity. We take one failure to be something that gets rid of someone forever. And the Bible's clear that it's not one failure that disqualifies you. It is a lifetime of pursuing failure, of staying in failure. And in that, it's yourself who chose the failure. But instead of legalism, there should be sanctification. And sanctification is being trimmed like a hedge or like a fruit-bearing bush for God's original mold for us so that we're not tainted by sin as much as we used to be the day before. Sanctification, like legalism, it's hard at times. It hurts at times. But the difference is it always works out. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. You and I are an entirely new creation. We are not the same old person at the core. When we got saved, maybe we were wearing a three-piece suit. I'm just sticking with this strange analogy for some reason. But we were saved. A new person got put in that three-piece suit. It looks like the same three-piece suit on the outside. You got the same tie, the same vest, the same handkerchief. Like I know what I'm talking about with suits. I own one suit and I even bought the wrong jacket. But the point is, God put a new person in that suit. He put his son, Jesus Christ, in that suit of your flesh and your life. Now, some of that suit is appropriate to continue on. But not all of it is. There are only vestiges of that old person in us that need to go away so that the new person can grow. There are parts of that suit that will no longer fit on Jesus' feet or on his arms. Or if you saw Jesus walking around with that attitude in his life, you would probably not see Jesus. And those are the things that need to go away. And if we're honest, it's probably everything. And the last thing that God really cares about is is what we're wearing. Now, there is a a call to be holy in our life and to wear things that are appropriate and there will be changes in our lives based on those things. But at the end of the day, it's not about what we look like. It's about who we look like. But as we get into our message, quite a long intro today, I'm going to do the previously on, you know, if you watch a TV show and then they catch you up right before. We've seen God calls and promises to Abram. He leaves his homeland. He's been waiting. He waited and he took his family and possessions and he wasn't really supposed to. Then God speaks to him at the terebin tree and Abram keeps passing through, keeps going, even though God spoke to him there, to the, uh, through the promised land to get back to a prosperous land. When Abram gets to that prosperous land, he lies. Sarai is given away, as we remember, and yet God still intervenes because God promised that they would have a child one day and that child would be a nation. And he gets them back on track, and even though they messed up and Pharaoh had problems because of them, God used Pharaoh to bless them. They walked away with more than they had before. God promises again to Abram, and this time Abram's heart turns and calls on God. Then Abram risks his life and he rescues Lot, that guy that he wasn't even supposed to bring with him in the first place. And he blesses God instead of the world. Remember, he he pays tithes to Melchizedek instead of taking a bribe and a reward from the king of Salem, uh, king of Sodom, rather. The next chapter, we find Abram looking to God for a blessing. He says, "God, can you bless me? I didn't turn to the world here." 
And God reminds them of the promise of an heir to come. So Sarai and Abram wait for about 10 years, but then they end up giving up on waiting and they get themselves and those around them in a mess with Hagar and Ishmael. But God, he rescues them. And despite even the best Christian platitude, he blesses their mess. He blesses Ishmael. He blesses Hagar. He says, don't worry, Abram. I'm still going to bless you through that son, but he's not the son of the promise. I've still got a promise coming for you, even though you didn't wait. It didn't negate the promise of God. If we look at this, we can say that obviously, in some shape, form, or fashion, Abram and Sarai were following God. We see them kind of going one way, and then slowly, 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 they're starting to get a little bit closer towards living a life totally of faith. You know, one mistake at a time, they learn to have more faith. And that's relieving because... How often do I find I learn the hard way? I don't read the instructions first, and I go, oh, I put this on backwards. <laughs> you know, we got new tires for winter, winter tires, and I put on all the tire sensors, and I put the first one on with the washer backwards, and it wouldn't hold air, so it took the guy at the, thankfully, it got fixed, the guy at the tire place was able to fix it. But uh, I'm like, oh, okay, yeah, <laughs> that, was the, that was the first one I did. <laughs> but obviously, there were still some of Abram and Sarai's old nature hanging on. Their old way of doing things. Oh, let's just get our handmade from Egypt. Oh, let's go down to Egypt, you know. And I, you know, it's hard to shake old habits. Mm. Things you've been doing for your entire life are harder to shake, perhaps, than things you've been doing for six months. I, I don't want to say it here, because then it's going to have to hold on to me, but I need to, I need to drink less soda. <laughs> it's like, but I've been doing this my whole life. It's hard. It's hard. I don't want to. And yet, God was able to have me kick harder things than that. But sincerely, things I've been doing, you know, a show you've been watching for a couple weeks, and you go, I, I should probably not watch this anymore, you know, for whatever reason. It's a lot easier than something you do in your whole life. But God is able to get rid of those habits you've had for your entire life. The question is, do you want him to? I remember when I got saved, and I was still smoking, and I would, got on the patch, and I was on that for a couple weeks, and God, God, I remember God just saying to me, like, just quit. <laughs> You don't need this. Like, I'm driving home, like, all right, you know, all right. And he was right. He was absolutely right. But I had to want to. I had to want to. I had to want to let him. I had to allow him to call that shot in my life. There's this old saying I was reminded of while studying, and it's possible. I was trying to find the origin, you know, hoping it wasn't like Buddhist or something. But, you know, even if there's truth in it, it's God's truth. But it possibly has an origin in a sermon of the last century, century before last, it says, watch your thoughts, they become words. Watch your words, they become actions. Watch your actions, they become habits. Watch your habits, they become character. And watch your character, for it becomes your destiny. And that has a lot of truth in it. The fact that we begin to think about something, then we begin to talk about it, and then we begin to do it, and then we begin to do it again, and then we do it again, and then all of a sudden we're known by the thing that we do. Now, that can go for a good thing, and that can go for a bad thing in life. But just because you've been doing this thing your entire life, and you say, I can't, I'm Italian, I'm Irish, I can't stop doing this, <laughs> that famous excuse, right? God can still overwrite those wrong choices. He can evaporate a lifetime of wrong choices and restore the years that the locust has eaten, as the Bible says, in, in a fraction of a second, less than that, in the blink of an eye. But it comes down to, obviously, like I said, if we let him, but it depends on whose words we're thinking on. What thoughts are we having? Are we meditating on God's words or our words? That'll change your destiny. You want to change your direction in life, consider the words of God. <clears throat> in Joshua 1.8, This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night. That's not focusing on your belly button and making weird noise. It's thinking about it. It's chewing on it in your mind. That you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. If you're a failure and you want to be a success, start thinking about God's word. Psalm 1, 1 through 2 says, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight, or her delight, is in the law of the Lord, and in his law he meditates day and night. And we need to delight in God's word. 
In Luke 6.45, Jesus says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. It ties in like what we were talking about a minute ago. That God has given us a new heart, and it will begin to overflow in our lives. But we must let him do it. We must let him fill it, because we cannot fake fruit for long. You know, there's a saying in the car world about a 20-foot paint job. You look at it from 20 feet away, that looks awesome. But as you get closer, 10 feet, all right, it's still not too bad. But then you get up real close, you're like, oh, there's lots of scuffs, there's some rust, there's a chip, uh, the clear coat's kind of crusty. You know, so that 20-foot paint job is, is not what God would have for us. He wants us to have that one that can come up and he can look and see his reflection in it without any of that orange peel. Ephesians, uh, sorry, Ezekiel 36, 24 through 28 says, For I will take you from among the nations, God says to his people, gather you out of all the countries and bring you into your own land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from all your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you uh, a heart of flesh, sorry. I will put on my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and you will keep my judgments and do them. Then you shall dwell in the land that I gave to your fathers. You shall be my people and I will be your God. You know that God will give us a new heart and new spirit and that's the only way we can get through life. We can't just change our suit, change our hat, change our tie. You know those things don't make us new. They make us have new clothes. But God wants to change our hearts, and he will give us a new heart and a new spirit. And that's the only way that we can be real Christians. Because we've got to realize that you're just faking it until he makes it. And when he makes it, he makes it last. Isaiah 43, 18 and 19 says, Do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. Now God wants to do a new thing. And he wants to do a new thing through Abram and Sarai, even today in chapter 17, despite them doing their own thing. So let's read the first eight verses together. Genesis 17 says, When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am the Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with and talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations and I will make you exceedingly fruitful and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you and their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. Also I give to you and your descendants after you the land in which you are stranger, all the land of Canaan, as an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. Abram here is 99. 99! I can't imagine being 99. I uh, was talking about uh, how much things have changed in our life. And my mom, I don't want to throw it at you guys now. She's going to be 76 this year. She had her 75th last year. I can't imagine. She doesn't look like it or act like it, but I can't imagine what, what the changes in, in the world are that she's seen, let alone someone who's 99 or older. But Abram, if you remember, was having that midlife, end of life crisis about 23 years ago. God, I don't have any air. I'm going to die. And, <laughs> What's going to happen? I don't have anybody. But it was 13 years since Ishmael was born and, and 10 years before that that God had promised them when they were living in the land. You know, God's timing is best. Despite Abram's huffing and fussing and all that, God knew that there's still plenty of time left for him. And you know, maybe it wouldn't have been 13 years if they had not taken it into their own hands. I'm reminded of the Israelites wandering through the wilderness for 40 years. Technically, from what I understand, a two-week journey. But they decide to wander. And if we're going to look at names today, Abram and Sarai, let's also look at God's name and let's see what he calls himself here. God calls himself here Shaddai, the Almighty, 
the Almighty God, Almighty, most powerful. It's like looking up at the stars, like God told them to do a few chapters back, and realizing how big God is. Remember, I told you, when you take out the trash, take a minute and look up. See how small we are and our problems truly are. Because God is almighty and is anything too hard for him. He says himself, Jeremiah 32, 27, Behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is there anything too hard for me? I wonder, do we think of anything as being too hard for God? As Christians, we probably would say no, but I think if we take a minute and get closer to that 20-foot paint job of a, a thought and belief, maybe there is things we think are too hard for him. But God says, walk before me and be blameless. And that word obviously is walk, walk, go about, go forth, etc. Before God, in the presence of, in the face of God. But I like what it says, not just be blameless. In the King James, it says, be thou perfect. Walk before God. God says, walk before me and be perfect. Oh boy, Lord, right, that's easy. I can do that. <laughs> no way, that's a tough one. The word perfect means to be complete, whole, wholesome, entire, sound, healthful, complete, entirety of time, unimpaired, innocent, having integrity. What is complete or entirely in accord with truth and fact? Who here has lived a perfect life before God? None of us. That's why we got saved. But after that, have we even remotely walked perfectly before God? If you have, you know, I'll buy your book. <laughs> and burn it <laughs> but not one of us you know so how can God expect Abram to do that I believe it's through believing in the promise of that heir believing in that promise God has for him a Messiah to come one day because we'll never be perfect in the flesh but we can walk blameless by his blood and by his body you know, the word integrity means the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles, moral uprightness, the state of being whole and undivided. As Christians, we need to have integrity. But that integrity truly comes from spending time before God's face. Because if we're going to stand up for what's right and good, we first need to bow down before the one who is good. Because the world stands up for what they believe is right and good. But if they stood before God for even one nanosecond, they would realize the things that they vouch for as good and holy and just are the farthest things from it. God says, I will make my covenant between me and you. God is the one doing the covenant. He says, I make my covenant between me and you. He, says, he doesn't say, Abram, you keep, you make, you deal. Like we might say with our kids, you clean up your room, you do this now, and I will. God says reverse, right? God says reverse. God says, I'm going to make a covenant. I'm going to do it between me and you. It's not between you and me, Abram. It's between me and you because God is the one determining the covenant. Joshua 24, 14, 15 says, Now therefore fear the Lord, serve him in sincerity and truth, and put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Serve the Lord. And if it seems evil for you to serve the Lord, choose for yourselves this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, Joshua says, we will serve the Lord. Joshua knew that there was only one side of that covenant he wanted to be on, and that was God's side. God had covenanted with them, and that alone was their motivation to do good. And that alone should be our motivation to do good, that God covenanted to us, Jesus Christ, and because he has, he's worthy of receiving our whole life. He's worthy of us giving him everything we've got. It's not our covenant to pay him back with those things. It wasn't on the dotted line when Jesus died on the cross. I'll die for you if you give me all this. He says, I'm going to die for you no matter what you give me. And because he said that, we should be willing to give it all and more than the all. Because a lot of times I think I give it all, but I realize I'm not giving it all. I'm holding back. But in verse 3, this humbled Abram. You know, like we talked about before, great news, blessings, honor can humble us. But also the request to live a holy life before God should make us fall on our face before him. God says to you and me, walk perfectly before me. We should fall down on our faces and go, God, I cannot do this. I cannot do this. You have to do this in me. You have to do it for me. We cannot live our best life now. We cannot speak his will into being. We cannot name it and claim it. But what we can name and claim is our failures and for what they really are, 
sin. But you know what? In due time, God will lift us up. But we must first bow down before him. And I like what it says next, that when Abram bowed down before God, it says that God talked with Abram. God didn't speak at him. God didn't set everything on fire and have him tremble even more. God didn't scold him. It said that God talked with Abram gently. I believe he had a conversation with Abram. And isn't that the Lord to come and minister to us in his still, small voice? And I ask, why don't we hear God? Why haven't you heard a word, or I haven't heard a word from him in our situation? Perhaps in 10 years. Perhaps in 23 years. Well, have you or I fallen on our face before him? Literally, have you fallen on your face before him? Gotten down on the floor before God. There are times in worship where I'll stand, I'll sit, I'll kneel. Um, no hokey pokey, but I'll sit on the floor. But there's also times where I'm being before the face of God in worship, or in prayer, and there's only one thing I can do, and that's lay down. And that's cover my face, partly because I'll start sneezing when I'm on the floor, but also because I'm before the face of God, and, and I realize that even though I'm here in my living room or in my bedroom, wherever I am, that I'm really in the presence of God, that spiritually I'm before the throne. Ecclesiastes 3.20, all go to one place, all are from dust, and all are returned to dust. Psalms 103, 13 to 14, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pity those who fear him. For he knows our frame, he remembers that we are but dust. For we're but dust, we should lay down where the dust lives. We need to lay down before him. We need to get on our faces before the Almighty God and see what he might speak. And I don't know if I've ever heard a harsh word from him there, like God talked with Abram here. I don't know if I've ever been on my face before God. And God's ever been harsh with me there. He's been hard with me other times, usually when I'm, you know, Gary Sneese and Forrest Gump, you know, <laughs> waiting for the lightning to strike him. But there's other times when I'm not, when I realize how frail and lame I am. And I'm before him and he's gentle. Even if I've been walking horribly, his word there is always one that forgives me or encourages me and builds me up and tells me of a promise to come. He calls him father of many nations, not just one. You know, I think everyone in some way strives to be a ruler of one nation, whether it's the ruler of your position or department at work, whether it's the ruler of your house, whether it's the ruler of an actual nation. But God promises Abram that his line will rule many nations and will rule over and over. You know, before he could have gotten... He could have, probably could have gotten some sort of kingship with the king of Sodom and these other guys, gotten some place in the world, but he pushed it away. And God's saying, don't worry, Abram, your place in the world is going to be much, much more than what these guys ever have or could offer. But we've been waiting all these chapters, all of Genesis, for Abram to become Abraham. Where now I can, from now on, say Abraham and not have to backtrack and say Abram. Abraham, I'm probably going to say Abram now. I've had to say this so many times. <laughs> But Abram means exalted father. You know, I remember his dad was so rich and powerful. And Abram's name is about being an exalted father. And yet he only has one kid. And it's not even from his own wife. It's not even, he can't even live up to his own name in his flesh. He's got a kid and he's a father, but it's not exactly an exalted situation, is it? But Abraham means father of a multitude or chief of a multitude. And I love that because it's through God's covenant, God's design, and God's doing that Abram becomes not just the father of one, but of many. Like we talked about last week, talk about a fertility treatment. He goes from father of nothing to father of many, or father of one in a in sort of a strange way to father of many in a beautiful way. Because El Shaddai says, I will. He says, I have made you a father of many nations, pre-planned, even taking Israel into account. He says, I make you exceedingly fruitful, more than you can imagine, like the stars. I will make nations and kings from you. You know, who else can guarantee that? I will establish my covenant with you. Only God can make a covenant with God. You know, 
no matter how good a lawyer someone is, they cannot make a covenant with God. Um, it's not going to work. He says, I will make an everlasting covenant. You know, who sticks around that long? To generation after generation. You know, so many people want to be remembered. They build a statue to themselves. But this covenant is forever. God says, I will give them the land. And the last he says, I, God, will be their God. And I think that that's the best part of the promise. That God will be the God to his descendants. That's all I want for mine. And like I've shared it before, I want inheritance for my kids. I want them to have a house that they can have or uh, things or money when they turn a certain age. All these things of the world. But most of all, I want them to inherit God as their God. I know that if I train them up in the way that they should go, if I help them in their gifts and talents to be musicians or athletes or architects or doctors or whatever they want to be, I know that if I haven't led them to make God be their God, all those things will lead them astray. You know, their desire to, to sing will lead them into the world and have their life fall apart. Their desire to, be, to use their mind and their education without God being God, they'll, they'll think of themselves as knowing it all and they'll miss God and they'll go down a path of destruction. And I don't want that for them. I know God doesn't want that for them. And I know deep down if they were to be wise as, as they are becoming wise, they would know that that's not what they want for themselves. You know, we need to leave a godly heritage to those around us. Spouse, if you have kids, uh, I'm sorry, whatever here. Okay, okay. So your spouse, if you pass first. If I die, I want to make sure my wife has a godly heritage to hang on to, that she knows that, you know, if there's never another guy in her life that he'll probably be better looking than me, but he better be spiritually better looking than me. She better not settle for no, uh, <laughs> no, no, no one worse than me, at least. Um, that's probably not too hard. Um, but also to our kids, you know, no matter how old they are, our grandkids, no matter how little, our coworkers, our friends, we need to leave that legacy. It's the only thing that will truly bless them and will truly last. It's not going to be obsolete. You know, you give them my computer or my car, but in 10 years it'll be obsolete, even sooner than that. And this won't be obsolete. It may go out of style, but it'll never fail them. Let's go on and read. 9 through 14. And I think exponentially we're going to get faster here, so I don't think it'll be two hour messages, it'll just be an hour and 45 minutes. But <laughs> in verse 9 through 14, it says, And God said to Abram, As for you, you shall keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you throughout their generations. This is my covenant, which you shall keep between me and you and your descendants after you. Every male child among you shall be circumcised. Abram goes, What's that? Verse 11, no, it says, And you shall be circumcised in the flesh of your foreskins. It shall be a sign of the covenant between me and you. He who is eight days old among you shall be circumcised, every male child in your generations. He who is born in your house or bought with money from any foreigner who is not your descendant. He who is born in your house and he who is bought with your money must be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. And the uncircumcised male child who is not circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin, that person shall be cut off from his people, he has broken my covenant. Verse 14. It's interesting that God says, my covenant shall be in your flesh. And, and where are we to hide God's word? In our hearts. On the tablets of the flesh in our hearts. He says, you shall keep my covenant. Well, how shall we keep God's covenant to us? God says, by walking blamelessly before him. That's how we keep it. But what do Abraham and his descendants have to do to keep God's covenant coming in? How do they make sure they keep getting God's check in the mail every month, so to speak? Well, it's by a personal, intimate, painful, and private, purifying sacrifice. Circumcision, you know, to cut around if we listen to the Latin. One and done. Get it over with, and that's it. It's a sign. It's a cutting of the heart of the flesh from men to show that their inner heart has also been cut. You know, a, a lot, of, a lot of men think with the wrong part of their body. But this, uh, this medical thing has a, a health benefit. But it also has a constant reminder when you're getting changed or bathing or in a marriage relationship that there's nothing covered or hidden. And I know this is a little PG-13. But baby boy is eight days old. You know, it's proof that God knows that it's time for blood to clot. It takes that long for the body to build up, I guess, the antibodies to do that. In the hospital, they do it sooner. It's like, I wish we could wait. But then they give them, like, a, I guess it's vitamin K, I guess, shot to help the blood clot. Um, but God says to do this. God says to cut yourself in this way, this personal way, to show that your heart has been given to me, to show that your heart wants to walk blamelessly before me. You may not be able to walk blamelessly before me, but at least you're showing in your flesh that you want to. 
And that's what we have to do. You know, if our flesh does not begin to show signs of a heart change, there's something wrong. If we say that our hearts have been changed by God, but our flesh has not been cut in some way, there's something wrong there. There's a disconnect there. We cannot say we love God and we haven't loved our neighbor. We cannot say we love God and continue in a sinful lifestyle. But he says to be born in a house, to be bought with money, uh, even those who are bought with money who is not his descendants, obviously his descendants should all not be circumcised, so if they bring someone in, um, they're going to have this done. I wouldn't want to be that guy who just got a new job. And <laughs> Here, come to orientation today. <laughs> you get a week off, but you got orientation. You know, other cultures have signs about their religion that are very outward and visible. Tattoos, piercings, headdresses, the way they paint themselves, um, styles of clothes even. Um, but the sign of God's people was not one at this time. Obviously, there's things in the law that come about. But at this time, was not one that would be seen by everyone or known right away. You know, thankfully, none of us can tell these days who's had this done at birth. But with that, a real Christian is one you'll know over time. Just because someone goes to church, has a Bible, wears a Christian t-shirt, bumper sticker, or listens to the music, it's going to come out of their heart. Their lifestyle, their words, their character will all begin to show whether their heart has been truly changed or not. Whether their heart has been cut off from the things of the world and from their flesh or not. Again, we're not perfect, but is your life and my life more circumcised today than it was yesterday? Ephesians 5, 14 through 20, talks about walking circumspectly, redeeming the time. You know, that this life should be one that's constantly looking around and making sure we're not stepping on landmines, but I believe also that our whole life, all around it, needs to be circumcised. There's not one part of our life that is not going to be touched by our spiritual circumcision. You know, that's the circumcised life. You know, Mia and her kids, it talks about singing to one another and spiritual hymns and songs. Me and the kids are always singing. Mia is quite the worship leader in our house or home. She'll sing and then Jacob will sing along. She'll say, come on, guys, sing. She makes up her own songs. I love it. It's beautiful. Or Ashley will be singing something upstairs and I'll get it in my heart or the kids will start singing or I'll play some music downstairs and then when I turn it off, I'll hear Mia singing it upstairs. It's fantastic. But it passes on because it comes out over time and it's evident and the more intimate our relationships are with others the more they will see our circumcised or lack thereof life and the more we'll notice them and theirs and perhaps that's why maybe we don't let other people in maybe we don't invite people over or hang around too long uh, at a Christian event because maybe we aren't being the church as much as we should be because we're not being the church in our own private, personal, and intimate time. Maybe we haven't gotten on our faces before the Lord. Like St. Chronicles says, when God appears to Solomon, after Solomon sought wisdom, and God says, if my people are called by my name and humble themselves and pray and seek my face, we know that. He says, then will I hear from heaven that we have to seek him first. He wants to hear, but we need, he needs to know that we want him to hear. But it says here that to not do it, that they've broken the covenant. And what's the result of not taking this covenant of circumcision? It's being cut off. God said, all I want you to do is cut off a little bit of yourself. And if you don't, it's going to cost you everything. You're going to be cut off from everyone and everything you care about. And sincerely, we'll either as believers cut off our sinful lifestyles our sinful habits will put off the evil, like God says, to put on the good. Our habits are our character, or will end up being cut off. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 through 11 says, Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. And he goes on and lists all these different things that they're doing. And he says, But were some of you. But now you've been sanctified. Now you've been justified and washed by Jesus. That, man, we need to cut these things off. We will not inherit the kingdom of God. Galatians 5, 19 so the same thing. He says, now the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunk, goes on and on and on, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things 
will not inherit the kingdom of God. But Paul says on the flip side, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law, and those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with his passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. That We're not just to circumcise our flesh, we are to crucify it. Not just to cut it off a little bit, but hang it up on the cross, hang it out to dry, hang it out to bleed until there's nothing left in it. Brutally. We can't play around with the flesh. Right? We just can't. Hey, sweetie. But we must continue to what Paul says, walk in the Spirit. Because it's the only way to be blameless. To maintain that covenant is to keep walking. I'm not saying not once saved, always saved. Oh, you got saved at Billy Graham Crusade and you're good to go. Or if you lose your salvation, that, you know, if you fail one time. But I think sincerely, perhaps, and again, don't take this too, too doctrinally, but sincerely, I believe if you're saved, you're going to continue to walk like it, no matter how many times you fail. And if you aren't truly saved, in time that will be evident. I don't think anyone loses their salvation. I think maybe it just comes out that maybe they never really were saved in the first part. And we all have different walks sometimes, you know. Your failure and your gutter lasts longer than someone else's. So I can't be the judge of that. But God is. But God is. And if you are saved, keep walking. Go back. Walk back. It's uh, 15 to 22 here. We'll read uh, 15 and then it says, Then God said to Abram, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be from her. Then Abram fell on his face, and he laughed. And he said in his heart, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? And Abram said to God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before you. Then God said, No, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his descendants after him. And as for Ishmael, I have heard you. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful. And I will multiply him exceedingly. He shall beget twelve princes, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, whom Sarah shall bear to you at this set time next year. Then he finished talking with him, and God went up from Abram. So Abram took Ishmael his son, and all were born in his house. And all who were bought with his money, every male among them of Abram's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskins that very same day. As God had said to him, Abraham was 99 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael's son was 13 years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. That very same day, Abraham was circumcised, Abraham was circumcised, and his son Ishmael. And all the men of the house born in the house were bought with money from a foreigner or circumcised with him. You know, God said to Abraham that God, Abraham, God's second word for him, for Abraham, was for his wife. And we talked about the relationship of a husband and a wife. But that God didn't show up to Sarah here. He showed up to Abram. For Abram to minister the word of the Lord to her. And that means I need to stay humble and my wife needs to stay humble. That we need to be able to hear from God for ourselves, but also for each other. And when we have a word for each other, to be able to receive that. Uh, there's lots of times when Ashley will have a word and I'll listen. And there's times when, when I don't. But I know that when I'm really seeking the Lord, I'll also go to her and, and, and listen and say, Well, what do you think about this? What has God been showing you? And she'll be faithful to share with me. And that always blesses me because... It, it helps. And it's the way it's supposed to be. But Sarai, her name meant princess, and Sarah means noble woman. You know, this princess hadn't become a queen and hadn't born a prince yet, who hadn't grown up spiritually all the way yet. She was still relying on her flesh with Hagar. But she would soon become those things and a mother of God's covenanted, God's chosen nation, and eventually the Messiah. If you look at Genesis 3 and the promise to the woman, but she becomes a mother of nations and kings of people from her. The same problems to Abraham goes to Sarah. And you talk about equality. They had the same promise. Abraham is the father of nations, but she was the mother of all these nations. And in 17, it says, Abraham fell on his face. And I think a lot of, uh, apparently he had gotten up if he fell on his face again, right? But he laughed this time. A lot of times we attribute it just to Sarah as laughing from the other story when the Lord shows up to go down to judge Sodom. Uh, that we'll see soon enough. Uh, but he laughs here. Abram laughed first. And Ashley and I have been laughing a lot lately at a show we've been watching, but, and I love it. But he's laughing at what God said. He doesn't believe it. 
He goes, it's got to be Ishmael, right, Lord? <laughs> it's not going to happen this way. I'm 99, you know. Uh, that's too impossible, even for you, Lord. It's got to be Ishmael. I think sometimes we come away as we're a bit stunned here. Think, oh, we never laugh at God, right? But sincerely, do we take his word seriously? Do we believe it when he says in Matthew 10, 7 through 8, as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons, freely received, freely give. Now, if, you, if we're building an altar here, I believe here comes the fire. Do we scoff at the rapture? Do we laugh at taking Genesis literally? That the earth, in all probability, is, could only be 6,000 years old. I know there's different views on this, but are there different views because they laugh at it or because there's actual evidence for it? Do we laugh when we, the Bible says the marriage is for one man and one woman? Do we scoff when we talk about sex outside of marriage as being sinful, dangerous, and having highly destructive consequences? Do we laugh, scoff, when someone says that life begins at conception? What about when we say that God loves you, that God has a plan for you, that you're not a bump on a log or on a pew, but that he has foreordained you for those great works to walk in? Do we scoff at that? I don't know that we do outwardly, but perhaps inwardly, because what do our lives look like? Do they look like we believe God in his word? Do, we, do they look like we don't? What does the church look like today? Is it truly his body? Or is it just an organization, a 501c3, a company, a club? What's it built on? The foundation of the gospel? The foundation of a preacher? You know, I think we laugh at the Catholics' interpretation of Peter being the foundation of the church so often, and the rock, when obviously it's the gospel of Jesus. God used Peter, but Peter was built on the gospel. You know, are we more concerned with how Pastor Chuck might have done things or how the Holy Spirit does things? Holy Spirit's still with us. Pastor Chuck, God used Pastor Chuck in a lot of ways. I'm not saying anything wrong about the way he did things. But are we more concerned with copying that or, or following the Spirit? John 3.8 says, The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. Let the Spirit blow you where he will. Don't laugh. Don't scoff. Believe it and walk before him blamelessly, even if others blame you for it. So interesting, Abraham laughs and scoffs and says, what about Ishmael, God? <laughs> God says no. God says no. And I wonder how often do we not believe God and bring our own plan to him, and God in turn says no. I wonder why God says no to us. If 2 Corinthians 1.20 says, For all the promises of God in him are yes and amen, and him amen to the glory of God through us, I have to wonder if maybe we're hearing no because we're not believing in the yes and amen of the promise he has already given us. Maybe we don't want the promise. Maybe we don't believe it can happen, so we bring our own plan. I don't know. Isaac, he laughs. You know, God knew that they would laugh in unbelief. Also, they would laugh at the joy of having a, a baby. But I think it's also a way for them to remember how great the miracle was because they laughed. Whenever they say Isaac, they can remember, oh, I remember laughing. God told me we, wouldn't, we were going to have you, and I didn't believe it. And now we have you. You know, he says even a year later that she hadn't even conceived yet. That God wasn't like, oh, uh, Sarah's pregnant, and you guys know it. But he says it's still three months until she's going to conceive. You know, that this promise was true, even if they hadn't seen it start to come to pass yet. But we need to keep expecting it to come to pass. Because Philippians 1.6 says, being confident in this very thing, that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Do we scoff when we think God can complete what he has started in our lives? Do we think that our life will end a minute before God says it's going to end and that he wouldn't complete what he needed to do? If you're worried about God not completing it, I wonder, are we walking before him blameless? You know, sometimes I worry at work because we have so much going on. Am I going to complete this? Because every time I try and walk to complete this, you give me something else to do. <laughs> so I'm worried that this isn't going to get done. And other times, you know, it's like if, uh, if I had been slacking or something, I might be worried that I'm not going to get it done because I haven't been doing what I've been supposed to be doing. And that's not the case with God. Uh, Jacob, go sit back with Mom. We're almost done, bud. 
You know, God finished talking with him here, and I know we're, we're going on a little bit long. We'll be done in a minute. But God finished talking with him, and that was it. God's like, all right, Abe. He gets up, and he goes and leaves him. And I think sometimes we might go, God, you're being rude. I wasn't done talking, and you just left. You know, where'd you go? But that was it. God had said what he needed to say, and there was nothing left to be said. And Abram was to take it as that. They didn't need to hash it out any further. Well, God, you know, what would Abram said? God, what about Ishmael? Are you sure about Ishmael? What about, are you sure? Positive? You know, God had said what he said he was going to do. He addressed Abram's doubt, and that was enough. And I believe sometimes we sit around talking too long with each other, praying over and over about something, perhaps. And we just need to stand up and get walking. Because if God's gotten up, God has said something. Uh, because if God has gotten up in your life, maybe God has said something and he hasn't said anything new about it in a while, it's time for you to get up as well. Because if he's done talking about it, that probably means we've heard all we need to hear about it and we need to begin applying it to our lives. But we see here uh, in the last few verses that Abram right away takes everyone. He gets done hanging out with God. He gets back from church. He says, Ishmael, servants, come with me. Bring your knives. Sharpen them. You know, I love how it says, it says Ishmael, his son. He doesn't say Hagar's son. It's clear that Ishmael is still Abraham's son. He still has a relationship with his boy, even though he's not the boy of the promise. He's still just important to him. But there's no delay. And I think that says that it's better to rip off the band-aid right away and get it over with when God tells us to, to sacrifice something. We need to get out of that relationship. Do it now. Don't wait till next week. Don't wait till Valentine's Day. Do it now. Sometimes that's true for what God says to us, you know? Because if we wait, our heart will get hard. We'll begin to go, oh, that knife looks sharp. Uh, well, tomorrow, tomorrow, Lord. <laughs> I'll feel better about it tomorrow. tomorrow. I don't, you know, I don't want to work tomorrow. I can do it tomorrow. <laughs> you know, they need to do the same day. They need to do it quick. I think sometimes before they realize what's happening. You know, the kids have to go to the doctor. And Ash and I were talking yesterday. She's like, I wonder if I can take them one at a time. Because when I take them in both at the same time, they see what's happening to the other one, and then they both start crying, and then it's like exponentially grows. And I wonder if Abram took them one at a time, or he said, all right, boy, same time. Because I think if they all saw, they might go, oh, I ain't doing this. There would be some backlash there. And I don't know. You know, I think maybe I'd rather go to Isaac's altar than this one. You know, sometimes we want to do the big, fancy work instead of doing the little, painful one. Second Corinthians 6.2 says, In an acceptable time I have heard you, and in the day of salvation... I have helped you. Behold, now is the acceptable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Hebrews 3.15 says, Today, if you will hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as in the rebellion. You know, it's not a rebellion if you haven't already heard the word. It's rebellion when we've heard and decided to go against it willfully. You know, there's between sin and transgression. Sin is just trying to do the right thing and, and not getting it. Transgression is, I know the right thing to do, and there's no way I'm going to do it. But it says that everyone was circumcised. And again, I'm not sure that they wanted Abram to go back to church next week. We know what happened last time he spent time with God, Abram. No thanks. You know, what's he going to cut off us next? And sometimes that's the way of the world, or even our family or our spouse will look at us when we come out from our time with the Lord. And we, see, we say, we need to make a change today, honey. We need to do this now, babe. Because we cannot wait. We cannot delay. It is going to hurt. And it's going to be sore for a while, but we must do this today. I ask, what has God promised you? Have you fell on your face before him in humility? Or did you roll around on the floor of your life in laughter? Let his yes be yes and amen for you. Let it be settled. Then get up and get rid of whatever is in the way of that promise coming to be. Hagar had to go back to her master. Abraham and Sarah had to wait for God. I don't know what it is for you and for me. Sometimes it's easier when it's like a blatantly sinful thing. Oh, it's clear I shouldn't be in this XYZ circumstance. But uh, his utmost for his highest says this, being born again by the Spirit of God means that we first must be willing to let go before we can grasp something else. And for Abram to grasp the promise, he had to take hold of the, the covenant, he had to take hold of the knife, and he had to take hold of his household. So God, this, this morning, or this afternoon, wherever we're at, 
God, you know. The things you've spoken to us, God, help us believe them and not laugh. To have faith, God, you've given us a measure of faith. Thank you, Lord. Please bring healing to Bob, we pray. Please just answer your promises to us, we ask. We know you will help us be patient and wait for them. Because, God, you do answer them. When you promise, God, you'll always come through. So help us wait. Help us cut out the things that are not holy, not to be a legalist and look at others, but sincerely that we might have nothing holding us back from following after you, that we might lighten our load of the things of the flesh that aren't necessary, that we might be closer and more intimate with you, God, to walk with you. That's what we need. Help us walk with you, God. And if we haven't heard from you or we need to hear from you, God, we always need to hear from you. So let us find ourselves on our face, even today, before our hearts go hard, or even this week, God. Whether it's on our face, whether it's in the car ride later, God, help us hear from you. We love you, God. Have your way. Come soon, we pray. We know that your promises are true. And yes and amen. We love you, God. In Jesus' name, amen.